Welcome to the Journey Mama Writings Podcast. I'm Rachel Devonish Ford, the author of the Journey Mama blog and books, and I'm currently recording my audiobooks. I'll be releasing the Journey Mama Writings complete as audiobooks, but also here in podcast format with hindsight, which is a section at the end of each episode where I share my thoughts on my experiences all those years ago. This is season one, where I read the book Trees Tall as Mountains, the first book in the Journey Mama writing series. I write many kinds of fiction, including YA fantasy, inspirational romance, and literary fiction. You can find my books on journeymama.com, and you can subscribe to get my posts or writing in your inbox. This podcast episode is published by Small Seed Press and is sponsored by my patrons at patreon.com forward slash journey mama. On Patreon, my patrons receive daily poetry and other offerings, including early peeks at new books and ebooks when they are complete. I'm so thankful for them. They make everything I do possible. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and follow me at journeymama.com or on Instagram where I'm at Journey Mama. Welcome to episode three. This episode is blog posts from November 2006 to December 2006 with hindsight. April. April 4th, 2006. 1. My superstar husband flew to Turkey today. 2. I'm crazy for saying no, I don't mind if you go. I think I was still experiencing the euphoria of prescription pain medication when I said that. 3. I like to torture myself by making decisions and then changing my mind when it is too late. 4. I aired all my apocalyptic fears while the poor man was trying to pack yesterday. Five. I don't deserve him. Six. It's mostly hard because Kai's whining is making my hair fall out, and Chinua is the good and patient one in the family. Seven. But today went okay. Kai whined a lot, but banging my head sharply against the glass door a few times made me feel better. I accidentally dropped a mason jar into the toilet, where it broke. I spent a few thousand minutes cleaning shattered glass out of toilet water. I played the no-nap game with the baby. I took care of some property tax issues. I fed my daughter sliced meat for a snack to keep her happy while I was on the phone with the property tax people. 8. The kids kissed me a lot because I told them not to. What am I teaching them by extorting kisses through reverse psychology? My mom folded laundry for me. Both my parents worked on painting my new home until late tonight. 9. We won't have to walk in the dark with the kids ever again until next winter. Thank you, reverse daylight savings time. 10. I'm really very glad that Chinua flew to Turkey today. It's just sad to be without him. 11. I'm joking about banging my head on the glass door. April 5th. 2006. It's no use arguing over whether the little lizards that the boys are finding all over the land are newts or salamanders because it turns out that they are pretty much the same thing. Except when they're dead, in which case I freak out. Elena came to collect Jed today and when the boys showed her their lizards, she said, this one looks dead to me. And then I had to suddenly turn and run quickly up the hill, shrieking. Not too many things make me scream and run away dead things, and people waiting in the dark to scare me. That always makes me scream. I remember one time in Berkeley, my friend Eddie ran up to me and growled, give me all your money. And I screamed so loud, I must have given everyone within a 10 block radius simultaneous heart attacks. Today it was two dead lizards in one day. Two is too many. One was huge, and we think a cat got him. And just thinking about him makes me want to get up and run out of my cabin. Speaking of dead things, why are all the hens dead? We have one hen left and one rooster. 
Skunks have killed the rest, despite a valiant effort to keep them safe. Not valiant enough, apparently. Those dastardly skunks, killing what they don't even stick around to eat. It's heartbreaking, especially since the hens were just about to start laying again. Today was day two of Chinua's absence. Today there was no glass in the toilet and a minimum of whining. The leaf baby took amazing naps all day. Our hot water heater was fixed. I think I neglected to mention that it's been broken for a while. And I made soup and biscuits for the community for dinner. I always love cooking for everyone because it feels like such an accomplishment, and I so rarely get to do it. I woke up with excitement thinking about Chinua arriving in Turkey, feeling almost like I'm arriving in a new country. April 6, 2006. Today Kenya did what I had hoped that no child of mine would do. She stuck a bead up her nose, a big, round bead, and I didn't even notice for probably an hour or so. We were sitting and watching Little House on the Prairie while I worked on her dreadlocks, and she turned to me and very mildly said, "Uh uh-oh, pointing to her nose, so mildly that I thought she was maybe slightly distressed over being a little snotty. It took me a minute to notice the big purple bead wedged in her nasal cavity. So I did what every parent would do, After freaking out for a moment over the possibility of a trip to the emergency room, I worked it out of her nostril with patience and much snot touching. It was one of those moments when I saw myself from the outside and thought, who are you and what have you done with Ray? Similar to the moments I spent cleaning glass out of the toilet or poo out of the bath or even the other day standing in a parking lot wolfing ravioli out of a can in the rain. That deserves more explanation. I was starving like a nursing mother can be, and all I could find was a drugstore. My superstar husband could tell you that I don't make the best judgment calls when I'm hungry, and I didn't want to smell my friend's car up with canned ravioli smell. So there I was, in the rain, eating nasty cold ravioli with shaky hands. Who is that person? It was probably the hardest thing about becoming a mother losing some pieces of identity that were important to me. And it was possibly the most important thing about becoming a mother, learning not to be defined by what I do. I used to be known as an artist, a painter. And after I had Kai, I really struggled with the fact that a lot of people I was working with had no idea that I painted at all. I don't really struggle so much with that stuff now. It seems that the edges have been slowly worn off me, I'm like a piece of beach glass now. Motherhood has softened me, and I don't even really care about my identity anymore, or how people see me as much. Not to say that I don't care about art. I still care as much as I ever did. But I love the absurdity of taking care of small children, of having no more than moments for yourself in a day, of doing totally disgusting things, because being a parent means plucking a bead out of your daughter's runny nose or straining poo out of a bathtub. April 8th, 2006. Today, Kai leaned over the side of the couch and whispered conspiratorially to the leaf baby, Your daddy's dead. Kai! I exclaimed, horrified. Don't say that. His daddy, I mean, your daddy isn't dead. Oh, Kai replied. He's in Turkey? This confusion between whether daddy is dead or is in Turkey isn't a wild question out of the blue. It all originated in the (gasps) Little House on the Prairie collection edition first season on DVD. Elena loaned it to me, and I thought, wow, it would be cool to watch some together before bed every day while Chinua's gone. We don't have TV here, and I figured that Little House on the Prairie is about as innocent as you can get. That is, until the little boy's paw exploded in a rock quarry. Wow, uh, whoops, what happened? I flustered, and then tried to fast forward past the part where Laura's pa has to tell the man's wife and son that he was dead. Tried, but managed to unpause it just at the point where the little boy says, Now that my pa's dead, I got a lot of work to do. A lot of work. I watched as Kai's eyes got bigger and bigger, and then after it was over, as they started to glisten, What are you thinking about, Kai? I asked. I'm thinking about how that little boy's daddy died, he said, 
in the saddest little boy voice ever, and the glisten turned into a couple of big tears that still managed not to spill over. We talked about it a little. Kai was confused about why the boy's dad died. Was it because he was yelling, he wanted to know? I told him no, it was just an accident. Then later, as we were getting into bed and we were talking about Chinua and crossing off another day on the calendar to show that it's getting closer to when he will be home, Kai said, is my daddy going to die? Again, in the saddest little boy voice you've ever heard. No, I replied. End of story. Because you can't even leave room in his mind for something like that. Not now. And we talked about how exciting it will be when we go to pick Chinua up at the airport. The next morning, he woke up talking about how excited he was to get Daddy from the airport. And I thought, phew. But today, the confusion persists. Is Daddy dead or in Turkey? As if it wasn't enough that he wonders daily about whether a big rock is going to fall from space to kill him like it killed the dinosaurs. I don't think he really thinks his daddy is dead, but it was probably the first time that it has occurred to him that a parent could die. Curse you, little house on the prairie. It's not that I want Kai to be in the dark forever about loss and sad things that happen in the world, but it seems like slightly bad timing during Chinua's longest absence from the kids. Kai's funny, the way he takes things in. He's a lot like me. We both personalize everything. If something bad could happen to someone on TV, then something bad could happen to me. It's the reason that I can't even think of the plot of Flight Plan. Waking up on a plane to find your daughter has disappeared? Ack! No! Can't think about it. La la la, I'm not listening. I've la la la'd my way through a lot of movies in my life. Walked out of even more. We'll just have to take the next two weeks day by day, crossing off calendar square by calendar square, sorting out the confusion between dead and in Turkey. April 14th, 2006. I will not feel sorry for myself. 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 I will not... Oh, dang. April 19th, 2006. My parents left yesterday. I feel a little lost. I was so amazingly blessed to have them here for three and a half months. I was spoiled by their help and love. Now, with Genua gone and them suddenly gone too, I feel like that halo of family care has been lifted and I am alone. Except that I'm totally not. I have the most amazing family around me, my friends here at the land, and no girl with her husband gone for three weeks ever had it better. At the very least, I have people to talk to, and I often have hands around me to help. But there is something about the love of parents, or should I say grandparents? My grandparents love their grandkids with the fervent intensity of devotees in an ashram in India, making their darshan gleefully. No one else feels this way about my kids. Except perhaps me. Maybe. What grandparents have that I don't have is distance. They have distance from a lot of the parental fears of messing up. They have a lot of freedom. They also have the assurance that they can always hand the kids back to the parents. I've loved seeing the relationship that has grown between my parents and my kids. Having my mom and dad staying here at the land has taught me a lot. A few things are, One, that I am sinfully independent. I would rather pull myself up a sheer cliff with my teeth than let someone help me. This past winter, after giving birth to my third child and having surgery, I've been forced to accept help from people who possibly love me more than anyone in the world. Pure torture. Two, that I am terribly controlling. Kai told his grandma the other day that she does a lot of things wrong because she put the juice in the cup before the water. Yes, I dilute our juice, instead of the other way around. I'm not as bad as that. I just don't like it when someone else does dishes for me, and the dishes are in the dish rack the wrong way. You know. Important stuff. Three. The grandparents are just as much family as parents are. This should be obvious. It's just amazing to me how much the kids thrive on the love of their grandpa and grandma. Four. That my parents are two of the most giving, 
loving, flexible, incredible people I've ever known. April 21st, 2006. I'm in LA right now, meeting lots of new people and hanging out with my friend Sherry. She's a great host. Some highlights. One, well, this actually happened before I even left, but as I was driving down to San Francisco from the land yesterday, I was having a great time. Spring has finally come. It was actually sunny and warm. The scotch broom is blooming, and I even caught sight of some lupin. I felt liberated as I began to drive through the vineyards north of Hopland, like I hadn't even known I was caught in the prison of winter until I happened to step outside. I may have been driving a wee bit over the speed limit. I was coming to the crest of a hill when a friendly soul gave me the old flash of the lights. Psst, there's a cop on the other side of this hill. I slowed down, and sure enough, just on the other side, there he was. Woo! A narrow miss, but for a little while I imagined how our conversation would have gone. Ma'am, do you realize that the speed limit is 55 here? Yes, but officer, it's so hard to drive only 55. The road is so straight and the scotch broom is blooming. Ma'am, this is a stretch of road with several vineyards and wineries along it. If you hit one of Sonoma County's best winemakers and knock him off, Napa will be all over us in an instant. We can't jeopardize our grape growers. Are we in Sonoma or Mendocino? Uh, I'm not sure, but I do know the speed limit. I'm issuing you a citation. I fall out of the car door. No, please. Ma'am, please take your hands off my ankle. Ma'am. Two. This also happened before I got here. I was in the airport waiting for my plane to board. Actually, back up. Getting through security wasn't so easy. I was carrying Leaf in my wraparound carrier, and the officer told me I'd have to take him out of the carrier. And then she said I had to take the carrier off, but I can't do that with one hand. And then she said she couldn't hold him for me. What was I supposed to do? Lay my three-month-old on the floor? Put him in one of the trays? I ended up enlisting the help of the people around me, asking a complete stranger to hold my baby so I could untie my carrier. Then my phone rang. A strange number. I answered, and the most beautiful, melodious voice in the whole world said, Ray? Chinua? I said. My heart leapt into my throat, and I almost started crying right there. Actually, maybe I did cry a little. It's amazing what a short absence does. Like the way I check my email these days. The way I did after we first met and we corresponded for a year. Both of us were crazy about each other, but neither of us were admitting anything. We wrote nice and deep and sweet emails for a year and checked our boxes thinking, Did he? Is there a letter? No. Or yes. It was so good to hear from my superstar husband. He'll be home on Monday. It's almost over. Three. It's weird. After living in San Francisco, LA seems kind of thrown together. The buildings don't go together and the signs are ragtag. It seems kind of shabby in a cool sort of way, but I think I prefer the well-ordered buildings and amazing hills of San Francisco. Although it may be hard to judge after only being here for a day. I definitely feel more at home in Northern California, though. In SoCal, I always feel a little bit like I landed from a different planet. Four. Yesterday, I went to a recording studio on Sunset Boulevard, where an old friend David was recording his new album. I was there to hear the music, so that I can get an idea of what I'll be working with next month when I paint for the live recording. I'll be doing art as worship, something that I love, something that I feel born to do. It was a little loud for the leaf baby right in the studio, so I was hanging out in the lobby and ended up getting a tour of the kitchen and hanging out with the cook. Curtis for a while. He chatted with the baby and told me about all the places he's been and lived. Chicago, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, and on the list went. Another of the workers bragged about all of the bands that come and record there. Next week it's Cheryl Crow. Today Van Morrison's here. Sometimes Maroon 5, Weezer. He went on too. I didn't ever see Van Morrison, just his gear. The studio was funny, they're obviously pulling in a lot of money, so why do the carpets look that way? It was very L.A. shabby cool, I suppose. Five. Who needs to be a star when you have a baby? 
Everywhere I go, people point and smile, stop and talk. It's great. I forget about this part of having a baby. It's like it opens people up. They trust you. They feel warm. And leaves smiles back and talks to them, rewarding them for all that openness. April 25th, 2006. Chinua is home and we met him at the airport with fanfare and squealing. I stood clapping my hands and smiling like a complete moron while I waited for the rest of my family to come over to the legal side of the line. I was trying to keep the kids from running under the barrier at the international arrivals lobby. You know, the barrier that looks like it's made of seatbelt material or something. They were pretty good about it, although Kai could not understand why on earth we couldn't just go looking for daddy. Once he showed up, though, they darted through like naughty puppies, and it was fine. No one's going to get angry with a couple of love-struck preschoolers greeting their daddy. I stayed on the proper side, though, bizarrely clapping, just clapping and clapping. I couldn't stop until I could hug my superstar husband. He looks good. He looks like he was out in the sun a whole lot, which he was in the mountains of Turkey. We've been watching some of his video footage, and it looks amazing. Kai can't stop talking to him. He wants to tell Chinua every single thing that has happened since he left. Speaking of Kai, I'm glad to see that by marrying one another, Chinua and I haven't diluted the absent-mindedness gene a single bit. Today, Kai wore two pairs of undies, since he forgot to take one pair off before putting the other pair on. I was so busy getting us ready to drive the four hours to the airport that I didn't notice. April 28th, 2006. Sometimes I struggle with anxiety that is so strong, I feel paralyzed by it. When I'm like this, I can't even have a normal conversation with my husband without feeling nervous and scared. When I'm like this, I'm so tense that my neck and shoulders feel like iron. If you knocked on them, they would ring. When I'm like this, I try so hard to just get my mind to stop, stop, stop already. When I'm like this, I start to panic. Anxiety often seems to overwhelm me when I feel like I've been doing really well for a long time. I feel like I've become free of it, like I can participate now, rather than just watching other people make normal decisions without feeling like the end result will be everything in life crumbling around them. And right when I'm participating with all that's in me, when I feel like I may even get a ribbon this time, it hits me and I'm startled and confused. It always makes me feel as though I have lost all the ground I gained. I think I was holding in a lot in over the weeks that Chinua was gone. I felt strong because I needed to be strong. I felt victorious. And then he came back and I turned into the little girl, the small one. All the weakness that I had been keeping under wraps came stumbling forward and I found myself no longer able to think clearly. I was apologizing for every word, every thought. Everything made me afraid. I had a really bad day yesterday which ended with me driving home at 10 o'clock at night, my van full of land groceries, crying uncontrollably on the phone to my husband while he tried to calm me down. The lady at Winco had yelled at me, had told me that my check raised red flags, had made me feel stupid in front of all the other customers. It was just too much after a day of trying not to listen to the destined-to-fail speeches in my mind all day, I fumbled my groceries into their brown bags and wheeled myself and my baby out the door, crying. On days like this, I turn into everyone's teenage stepdaughter, angry and defiant at all of my stepparents. The lady at Winco is no longer just a grumpy late shifter. She now gives me identity, gives me definition, and she has decided that my checks are no good. Not only that, she has implied that I am a liar. She must know. She must be right. Everything is confirmation of what I've always feared, that I'm not going to be able to participate, that I'm not a good girl. These ideas I can usually fight off, but sometimes when anxiety grips me, it's like my white blood cell count has fallen drastically and the virus is win. This is when I am utterly flattened, sitting shapelessly and wondering if I'll ever stand back up. They asked, speaking about Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But this is what they forgot, that God likes people from little tiny shabby places, that he makes broken things new. At times when my mind is so cluttered that I can barely see through the weeds, 
This is about all I have to stand on, and it is enough. April 29th, 2006. Imagine living in the most beautiful campground that you ever went to in your childhood. It's your home. Now imagine being there year-round, walking from building to building in the rain, shivering in the dark. Imagine losing your running water for hours or days at a time. Imagine poorly insulated buildings, which we are working on, hooray, and small fires and stoves that may or may not be maintained. Imagine a lot of wetness, rain day after day, and a lot of darkness, using a flashlight to get from dinner to bed. Imagine that it is still wonderful to live in this campground, even during the long, wet winter, because you get to live with your friends and play games, and it is beautiful even in deep, dark shades of gray. But now imagine that it's summer again, and the sun is shining and everything smells green and living. Imagine warm evenings when the kids are in bed. Imagine feeling giddy and liberated, wearing short sleeves in the warm night air. Watching the Green River, knowing that any day the weather will be warm enough for you to swim. Listening to music and dancing your way around the wide paths. It's heaven. I feel like a little girl. I love pulling out the kids' sandals, looking for shorts in secondhand stores. I love seeing more of them, their little brown feet, the little legs, their chubby knees. Today we went on a picnic and just lay around like cats in a patch of sunlight in one of the redwood groves just up the street. We had so much fun, walking on huge fallen trees, watching a snail, trying to climb a giant boulder. Kai was so cute and little big boy as he confidently tried to scale it and then ran back to me shrugging, nah, I don't want to, as he climbed into my lap. Kenya has been sick and it's so sad. She's not her usually spunky self. She's been clinging pretty close to me, and when we're in the cabin, she follows me around whining, Mama, over and over again. She's getting better now, and we're all glad. I love Kai's curiosity, the way he makes things up. I asked him about a bruise he has on his leg, and he told me he got it running up a tree. I love that Kenya has named one of her feet Mama and one of them Daddy, and that she makes them kiss and talk to each other in squeaky voices. I love that Leaf is turning into an adorable, chunky baby who drools incessantly and is what you would call jolly. He's got this big, wide smile, and it's very boy. All of him, even his gigantic feet. Yes, I'm feeling a lot better. We're getting ready for the festivals this summer, where we'll sell art and photography. And I've begun my painting marathon. Last night, Chinua finished putting the kids to bed, and I listened to music and painted and painted and painted. May. May 4th, 2006. I have a little room at the land that I've been using to paint in. I like to call it my studio, even though it's a very temporary place for me to use to make art in. Calling it my studio helps me paint better. It's not a glamorous spot, but I have a new love for life since I've been painting again. So to me, it's a loft in the Presidio of San Francisco. Painting even helps me be more fun with my kids because it fills me up. I think that art is what I was born to do. One of the biggest treats that I can give myself is to go to the art store and buy a new tube of paint, an ultramarine blue or a cadmium yellow. If I'm really feeling crazy, maybe a permanent violet. Not gray. Never gray. In my opinion, gray is the biggest waste of money in the paint world. Summer came to us swiftly. It doesn't even feel like spring with 80 degree weather every day. Today, Jed and Kai were playing in the kiddie pool on Jed's porch. One minute we were freezing in the rain, the next minute all our heaters are off and we'll be saving tons on our gas and electric bills. Sweet. I've been hanging out with Job, our tree climbing rooster. Well, I guess he doesn't climb, he flies. Job is a survivor. He has survived two major massacres when both sets of his wives were killed. In the first massacre, he was the only man left standing. That's when he received the name Job. Then he got some new wives, and they have been slowly picked off this spring by vicious and nasty skunks who can apparently chew through chicken wire. Job has one wife left, and they've got the spring love bug, which can be a little embarrassing. Keep it in the coop, guys. May 17th, 2006. 
Rooster Wisdom It is not wise to feed the local friendly rooster out of your hand on your porch, since this may cause him to come calling at 5.30 in the morning, looking for more whole grain bread. And he may call and call, looking through the glass door, possibly waking your baby up, causing you to curse him and your husband to stumble out of bed and throw stones in his general direction. It may be wiser to feed the local friendly rooster on someone else's porch, someone who needs to wake up earlier. Someone may be like my friend Renee. June. June 2nd, 2006. Tonight, I've been thinking about how I probably won't remember too much about the hard stuff of having small children once they've grown older. The poo everywhere, in diapers, out of diapers, poo on the floor, on the wall, in the crib, on me. Or the amazing number of times that Kenya has vomited after overeating. Or the fact that I never even seem to sleep very much anymore. And I always feel exhausted. I'll probably remember their brown feet in sandals, the way their skin smells after they've spent the day in the sun, the sweet strawberry smell of a nursing baby's breath little hands on my cheeks, the elusive and overwhelming kisses, the compulsive smiling of four-month-olds, the funny waddle of a year-old baby, Kenya mispronouncing everything, Kai pronouncing everything perfectly except for poached eggs, which he still calls proached. You know, the good stuff. June 8, 2006. Although I try to be as honest as possible on this blog, I obviously refrain from writing about some things. Some things aren't meant to be read by all. Some things are too deep to be written about. Some things are too despairing. Some are too complicated. Some are too personal. And all the things that have been rolling around my head lately are those kinds of things. This, combined with my extreme busyness, which has me running from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, in preparing for our booth at the festival this weekend has kept me from posting as much as I like. I could write about the daisies, which are the new poppies, springing up everywhere, down the highway, on the hillsides, in the neglected garden. I could write about my exhaustion again. Lucky you. I could write about how hard it is to get prepared for something like this festival when you live so far away from all the supplies you need. How Chinua came home from the city on Monday only to drive away for the day on Tuesday, preparing only to have me drive away for the day yesterday, picking up more stuff. Are we crazy? Yes, maybe, a little. But I need to go, because we're heading out to set up camp in five minutes. Life is sometimes hard and sad, and that passes, but sometimes I can't even find anything funny in it. And that is when I know it's been a little harder than usual. June 14th, 2006. I am trying to recover from one of the most disastrous weekends that I've ever had. Chinua and I are so exhausted that we might decide to implode. Scenario 1. Thursday. We leave for the festival feeling bright and chipper, although a little late, in a caravan of two vehicles. Derek warns me before we go that the van has a tendency to overheat. He warns Chinua. We forget to warn Renee, who is driving. The van overheats on the side of the highway as we are on our way with the three kids. I decide to drive down with the baby in the other car so that I can register for our camping. The others will wait for the van to cool down and then follow. Except that our beloved old red van became a little too hot and will never drive again. Chinua sits on the side of the road for five hours with Renee and the two kids until Derek is able to come and rescue them. I wait in the cold car, shivering and wishing I could eat a gallon of creme brulee to help myself feel better. They reach the campground, a gravel RV lot, at 1 o'clock a.m. We proceed to pitch the tents and lay our weary heads down. Maybe tomorrow will be a better day, we think. Rest in peace, Red Van. You were good to us. 18 years and 279,000 miles is a good life. You were even stolen once and then recovered but I think that this time it really is goodbye. Scenario 2, Friday. We are a day behind now. The guys pick up the stuff they need to construct the booth while Derek, Spencer, and Renee and I sit around trying to amuse young children 
in a gravel parking lot. The kids do really well, falling down a little more than we normally advise, but mostly entertaining themselves fabulously, throwing rocks at cars and stuff. Next, it's my turn. Renee and I run about a thousand errands, picking up business cards, mats, and prints, and buying food. We return. Chinua starts to look through the photography prints that we will be selling. A little while later, he calls me over to the van. This isn't good news, he warns me. Basically, the printer did a terrible job. The prints look like a five-year-old did them on a printer made in 1985. They are unsellable. Fortunately, he didn't have them already, so we didn't pay for them yet. Unfortunately, we now have 13 prints to sell, prints we had done previously at a shop recommended to us by a friend. We are doomed. I cry myself to sleep. Lesson learned. Always test a printer, even if they have great equipment and show you great samples. Scenario 3, Saturday. Chinua is able to bring the prints back, and in showing him the difference in quality of several prints from the same files helps the guy to understand why we can't pay for what he's done. I feel really, really badly for this man, but he does need to learn. We work feverishly at framing the prints and have the booth ready just a little bit late, not too bad considering our breakdown in the red van. Another friend has brought her paintings, and I have one of my own. We had originally intended to have my paintings and prints for sale, but due to a lack of time, had settled on selling only Chinua's photographs. So we managed to fill the empty space with those. The booth looks really, really nice. We sell absolutely nothing. Nothing. Nope. Not even one. Nothing. All the vendors are doing terribly, although I hope none did as terribly as us. One lady said that her hat business did the worst it had in 16 years. I think it was a combination of having too many vendors and the extremely high price of the festival. I don't cry anymore, although it does feel a bit torturous to sit at the booth and continue to sell nothing. Lesson learned, we won't be doing this again. Scenario 4, Sunday. Sunday is pretty much the same as Saturday, more sitting at the booth, not selling anything, except that I now know that my children have Coxsackie's virus. They have sores in their mouths, although they have no fevers, and this isn't all that bad, except that it makes them absolutely miserable. Crying, tantrums, lying on the grass, and weeping inconsolably. It's pretty horrible. Kenya is affected more than Kai since she soothes herself by sucking her fingers, and this is painful. She feels miserable and she can't comfort herself. Lots of crying ensues. We break up camp and come home. A little poorer, a little more humble, a little shaken. Poor, poor us. On the extreme upside, I am right now at this very moment sitting at a table in my house, in my large front room. The kids are sleeping in their room. Today we moved across the land to our new house. We feel a little nostalgic. This little three and a half year era of sharing one room with our family has come to an end. We've gone from 280 square feet to almost 900. It's crazy. Chinua sat as we were walking across the land. This is the only good thing that has happened to me in a long time. It's truly a very good thing. June 16th, 2006. Why is it that things all seem to happen like fruit flies popping out of their eggs? All at once, with no warning, suddenly the country that is your home is invaded and you are no longer alone with your fruit. Your fruit comes with friends. Maybe there are too many bruises on the fruit. Bruises like forgetfulness and tiredness and the need for a long hot bath. I'm pondering fruit because today, on my way back from the city, I locked Renee's keys out of her car. Yes, I know. Whatever you have to say to me, I know. I have an excuse. We stopped so that I could nurse the leaf baby, who, by the way, can say ba-ba-ba now, and I left the keys in the ignition while I nursed him. Then we blissfully hopped out of the car and into the dollar store to buy stickers for Kenya for our upcoming road trip. The mistake was in not taking the keys out before we got out of the car and locked all the doors. A couple of hours later, after some very fun adventures that involved asking lots of people for help, we were on our way. The people from the tow company that came out, no, I don't have AAA, and yes, I think people like me should, 
were feeling jokey. They noticed that Renee had bought me ice cream to make me feel better, since I was obviously on the verge of turning over the tomato cart, and said, There is an upside to everything. You got to have ice cream. I just glared them down and said bitterly, Yeah, $50 ice cream. Anyway, I told them this story, so I thought I'd write it down. One time in the city, the community red van got stolen. The same one that just took its last drive on the way to the festival where we didn't sell any art. We don't really name our vehicles. It's red van, blue van, blue car, RV. The red van had a little problem with the ignition, which means that pretty much any key could start it. I can write this on the internet now because our van is in a junkyard. Apparently, this lack of key discrimination happens to a lot of old Toyota vans. And thieves in downtown San Francisco happen to know this because one day it was just gone. Bummer. We filed a police report. A few weeks later, our great friend Jesse turned to Chinua and smacked himself on the forehead. Chinua, he said, I totally forgot to tell you something. What? Chinua asked. You're going to be really mad, Jesse said, and he told him this story. I was skating downtown near the Civic Center, and all of a sudden I saw our van. I mean, I wasn't sure, but then I saw the in and out sticker on it, and I was sure it was ours. So I skated after it, and I got the guy to stop. He looked pretty nervous, but I just said, that's our van, and he said, oh, my friend had it. I told him it was stolen, and he said, I can give it back, but I just need to drive to Daly City because I'm picking up a friend, and he's waiting for me. I said, sure, bro. So he gave me his phone number, and I let him go. We were pretty blown away by this, but then Jesse told us that this had happened a week before. He forgot to tell us. Anyway, to make a long story short, the police eventually recovered the van and we got it back. Crazy, huh? Jesse's pretty nice. Nice enough to make sure that one of the guys who stole our van is able to get to his friend in Daly City and pick him up. Right now, what I'm really supposed to be doing is writing a reference letter for my friend Curtis, who is going to get a job as an EMT. He and his wife Elena are leaving this weekend, moving away. I can't say how sad this makes me. It's hard for me to even imagine this green place without homeboy and his lovely wife. I'm thinking that maybe if I just write a really bad letter, he won't be able to leave. That will probably backfire. I'm going to write the best darn letter I can. June 18th, 2006. The road she calls us. We leave in a few minutes for our road trip to Colorado for the annual National Rainbow Gathering. I've had all sorts of emotions about this, from resistance to elation to I'm going home right now. But I think I've set myself on going, so now I need to zip the lip on complaints and death threats. We are taking our RV with six adults and three kids. We didn't mean to have so many people in our little RV, but somehow we forgot to do a head count. Ah... There is always more to write about this way. Here are the hindsight notes for episode three. This episode was from April of 2006 to June of 2006. And I just have a few thoughts looking back on this time when I lived at the land in Northern California. And yeah, just all my thoughts about this time. So here they are. So first of all, I have a lot of love for these days, Uh, thinking about that little tiny one-room cabin that we lived at for a long time, and how we did all of our dishes in the tiny bathroom, and that's like where I say I dropped a mason jar in the toilet, it's because I did my dishes in this tiny bathroom sink. The kids took their baths in a tote, a plastic tote um, box, kind of plastic box thing that we had in the shower. And then we would take the dishes out. I think we would dry them. I think we had a drying rack on the porch, maybe. The stove was a little camp stove that was on the porch. We didn't cook so much there because we shared a big kitchen with other members of our community. But most of the cooking that we did there was stuff like breakfast or I cooked the kids oatmeal there or I made my coffee in the morning, stuff like that. We made sandwiches. Yeah, we had a tiny little... Tiny little space there, a tiny little fridge, tiny little um, bathroom that was really, really cute and small. And yeah, I have a lot of love when I think about those days. 
And I think about the fact that we had, yeah, two little like toddlers and a baby and then Chinua went away, um, which was amazing. And yeah, I think really good for him. My parents were there, as I said, for a little while. Um, another side note, this was a trip where things really changed for us. Chinua went on this trip. It was a rainbow gathering in Turkey. It was the Peace in the Middle East Rainbow Gathering. And Chinua went to Ephesus after the trip. And he really felt sort of quite strongly that like this sense of us, like almost like a voice or something saying like, you need to go. And it was it was really important. Um, we started to really think about what were the next things for us as more and more people went on from the land and went to do other things. Some people went to school. Some people found jobs in different communities or moved to be closer to their families. And once there were like really just a couple families left, we had to start thinking about what was going on in the future. At the time, we thought that we could spend part of the year in America and part of the year in a country across the world, which was what we had been hoping to do. Let's get back overseas as soon as we got married. But we realized after a while that that wasn't going to be feasible for us. So yeah, these were just like the first inklings. And when I say that Tanua heard this, it was that he was in like an ancient baptismal font in the shape of a cross in Ephesus. So it was kind of like an important moment. The third thing is dead things. I was just saying this other day when the boys found a dead snake. Isaac and Jasper found a dead snake and they put it in a plastic bag and they were carrying it around. And I was just like, I couldn't handle it. And I am not afraid of live snakes, but I am afraid of dead ones. So fear of dead animals has always been a thing. Here we have dead geckos or dead rats. There we had, what was it, like a lizard that they found, a salamander or something. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, yeah, I talk a little bit about losing parts of identity. And I think that the whole thing of identity is such a lifelong journey now. I look back on that and I think it's only the beginning. The holding and releasing of parts of our identity as we change, I don't know, it's really important to come to terms with. I think identity as a role, in a way they say that you shouldn't identify with this, but there's almost no way not to. When you really throw yourself into what you do and who you are, you need it. You need the identity to make thing, yourself do things. Like I, I operate out of identity when I get myself to do stuff. I think I am the kind of person who does this. I am the kind of person who does this. That's how I motivate myself. So I need it, but I have to release it again and again as things move along. And I didn't realize that this was going to go so fast. My first son has moved away. Mother of small children is not a part of my identity anymore. And I remember the moment when I thought, oh, that's not me. I'm looking at all these women and seeing that that's them and it's not me anymore. It feels sudden, you know, and I feel like I went from not like being a teenager into suddenly being an older woman. And that is, it didn't happen as fast as I think it did, but I'm starting to be someone that looked people look up to as an older woman and so releasing the young part of my identity is also an interesting process I have written down here number five Kai was always sensitive about shows and I just feel such a welling up of love for little Kai reading about this I remember when we tried to show him the Lion King and he didn't even get to the part where like you know the traumatic part where Mufasa falls off the cliff. Sorry, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen The Lion King. We didn't even get to that part. We were at the part where Mufasa gets angry with Simba for going to the elephant graveyard. And Kai was just, he just couldn't handle it. Um, such a sweetie. He just couldn't do it. Yeah. It was very sweet. The time of having my parents at the land, I... I mentioned this at the beginning, but this was something so special. Um, they were there to help us, and they were there for several months. And it was beautiful. 
They helped us to renovate an old building into what could be a home for a family of five. And they, yeah, they just did a really, like, lovely job of being such good parents to us and helping us and living in this property. And I remember they had a rat in their cabin that was eating their soap all the time. And there was a lot of fun, a lot of joy in those times of being together. Um, Another thing was the painting. I mentioned that I went to do a painting, and this was something in my old life um, (laughs) that I don't do as much anymore, but it's something that that used to happen quite a bit. That's sometimes people would put me up on a scaffolding, on scaffolding, and then I would paint while the band played at a conference or at a worship session or an event. And yeah, you can really read how or hear how I love travel so much and how it just brings me alive. Even just now, we went down to the islands after like three years of being, not three years, maybe two and a half years of being in Pine nonstop. And we, yeah, just travel brings a sort of sharpness and uh, awareness, awakeness to life. Oh, I wrote about the hangover after being strong. This is something that I still don't think I've figured out. Last time that Chinua went away, he was away for two months. And at least we talked about it, you know, like um, I was telling him as he was coming back, like we've had two completely different experiences and somehow we need to sync up. So he was away, he was traveling, he was doing a lot, working, but also being around family and sort of having all those experiences. And I was back here kind of holding stuff together and really trying to be as strong as I could while he was gone. And syncing up is so hard. I'd be so interested to hear how other people feel about this because I find it really hard. If I've been the one at home, I need to process a bit of it. And it, I think it can feel a bit like complaining to the other person sometimes but when I hear the adventures I hear them with love and I'm a little bit wistful about it all it's I find it challenging and I'm surprised that I don't read more about this part of parenting Mm, I I think this is about the check I wrote about um, feeling suspicious a lot in America when I've lived there we've you know we've had many times where people have looked at us with suspicion and it's maybe the way we looked, um, living under the poverty level, being volunteers, working with people who are on the margins, um, being a mixed family, being Chufra being black. It's a constant struggle for many people and it sort of adds stress to all these other things. And just, yeah, I was constantly there being questioned on, you know, a check or, a anything I was doing there was sort of a sense that maybe I might be trying to get something shifty across so I was sort of having to do this justification and it's given me a lot of empathy for people in that position I would say knowing that yeah it just it adds this extra layer onto the hard parts of life Mm, reading I wrote the notes the heaven of summer in the redwoods Oh, it's a glory that can't be compared. It is the most beautiful thing, summer in the redwoods. The smell, the way, yeah, in the shade, you're quite cool, but then you can go into the heat. Oh, it's beautiful. Then I wrote, the heaven of painting. I love painting. I love it so much, and I still don't do it enough. I always thought I would get back to more of a full-time art life, but it's still a part of my life. I love it with all my heart. I love the smells of oils. I love I love everything about painting. I wrote something about how I would look back on life in sort of a gentle detail. And it's true. I do. I remember it. I remember it, but I remember it in a gentle way. And I remember the kisses and the smells and the hugs, most of all, of small children. I love it when I think about it. Um, I wrote about a disastrous weekend with the kids getting sick and all these things happening when we were trying to put a 
I think we were trying to sell art at a festival. I am amazed that I was able to write about this weekend at all. It was disastrous in so many ways. (laughs) And so many things happened and so many things wrong. And there was a lot of emotional stuff that went on. And I think that this post is a true testament to the power of being able to tell your story. Like when you can sit down and write your story, so you can process things so much. So tell your story, friends. That is what I want to say to you. We moved into the bigger house, which was amazing. That was so beautiful. I, it was, it was lovely. It was such a, such a, consolation to us to live in that space for the time that we did and then I told a story about Jesse Um, our Jesse was our dear dear friend and he passed away a number of years ago Uh, he had cancer and so whenever I read stories now with that I've written about him I feel a lot of love and sorrow and thankfulness that we got to know him and then another trip and travel is so, it's just such a balm to the soul. Hey friends, I wanted to let you know where you can find me. Thank you for listening to the Journey Mama Writings podcast. You can find me all around the web. Right now I have a couple of new books coming out. So if you go to journeymama.com, you will find links to those books you can find me at on Instagram at Journey Mama. You can find me on TikTok at Rachel Devonish Ford. You can also find me on Patreon where I am Journey Mama. My address is patreon.com forward slash Journey Mama. Um, Journey Mama is M-A-M-A at the end, just the simplest way to write Mama. And any of these places are places you can follow me, you can keep up with me. If you're an Instagram person, I love to record stories or reels of poetry on tiktok i'm doing poetry you can search for my youtube channel everything is linked in the show notes and the two books i have coming out one of them is a poetry book it's from a year of writing daily poetry it's called everything bright clear and beautiful a year of poetry and it comes out this month on may 25th the other book is the sixth book in my YA fantasy series and it is called a crown of stars and i will link them both in the show notes down below or you can find them at my website if you go to journeymama.com slash subscribe you can get my monthly emails and it tells everything about what i'm up to so that's how you can keep track of me on the web thank you so much for listening it means a lot to me